Welcome everyone, uh, be you on site or online, wherever you are in the world, uh, whichever time zone. Welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to our workshop, Digital Sovereignty, Regulation, Protectionism and Fragmentation. Uh, before we begin the session, I uh, just a as a reminder, if you would like to step in during the discussion or during the question and answer session at the end, just please state your name and make sure to use English uh, as a language. Also, if you are online and you'd also like to step in, just please um, put your name in the chat and please make sure that there is a question mark at the end of your uh, question. So without any further ado, uh, welcome again. My name is Daniele Tura. I'm from Italy. I'm one of the Internet Society's uh, Youth Ambassadors for 2023. And I will be the on-site moderator uh, for this session today. Also, we have Herman uh, Lopez Ardilla. I hope I pronounce it right. Uh, he's uh, our online moderator and he's sit uh, right here in the audience with everybody else. And also, uh, we'll have Natalie as our uh, rapporteur for today. So, worldwide, as an increasingly large number of networks are becoming dependent on proprietary protocols, we are experiencing the rise of national and private interests in cyberspace. So this and other phenomena suggest that IT procedures, standards, and access to data infrastructure could be used to raise technical barriers to trade or negatively affect the sharing nature of the internet, actively shifting the equilibrium towards particular interests, be them economic or political in nature, therefore reinforcing, again, a protectionist approach. So today we will try to understand if the tension between the power exerted under conditions of digital sovereignty and digital protectionism may actually translate into an increased risk for citizens' rights and the internet at large. Particularly, we want to explore how different regions and stakeholders perceive the need to strike a balance between these two categories and how this creates new dimensions in the discussions on internet fragmentation. In fact, despite the efforts to rightfully seek to protect collective interests through economic or social considerations, in some cases, the broadness of these concepts has been used to promote censorship and raise trade barriers for foreign companies. Today, politicians and big businesses initiate fragmentation processes that the technical community alone can no longer control. Furthermore, if fragmentation would be to uh, would to be achieved, it will limit the internet and its critical properties as an unable of choice. So throughout the session, we will try to tackle three main questions with our guests. The first one is, what are the most impactful legal initiatives around the globe with potential fragmenting effects and what are their justifications? On a technical level, are there tools or protocols that promote data protection for a country's citizens and companies? And the last one, what could increase the risk of unfair limitations to legitimate economic use of data restriction, free trade, and the harm, of, uh, the harm to physical infrastructure of the internet? Of course, these are all relevant issues that cannot just be taken uh, from uh, simply uh, global perspective, but it's very important to keep regional differences in mind. So this is why uh, today's panel is composed from stakeholders coming from all over the world and from different groups. So together we would like to outline a typology of risks brought by different approaches to digital sovereignty in various regions. And this will help uh, the community in general identify a sketch of measures and actions for ensuring compliance with data regulations on a local level. So the overarching approach um, will respect multi-stakeholder guidelines on how to avoid internet fragmentation and digital protectionism and its uh, hindering effects while advancing in legitimate protection of citizens. 
So we hope uh, that through the sessions, participants will be able to access collective knowledge by discovering answers to their concerns themselves within the context of their own working groups in their own regions. I invite you all to actively engage in the session, to listen to our esteemed panelists, and to contribute your insights and your perspectives during the question and answer uh, section. So let me begin by introducing our speakers. So we have Nilish Maheshwari. Uh, he's a PhD candidate uh, from South Asian University in India. He's been part of the Youth IGF India and was also a fellow of the India School of Internet Governance. His articles have been published uh, in the Kathmandu Post and by the Stimson Center. Um, also, we have a guest from uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, he's Vincenzlas Katimba. He's chief advisor for IT infrastructure at the Ministry of Digitalization in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Bruna Martis uh, dos Santos is here at my left. Uh, she is global campaigns manager at Digital Action. Welcome. She's a current member of the multi-stakeholder advisory group at the IGF, as well as a member of council for the generic name supporting organization at ICANN. Also, we have another online guest. His name is Andrea Beccali, is director for stakeholder engagement at ICANN in Europe. So welcome, everybody. So I will now start uh, presenting uh, the first question, and we'll have Nilish introduce his uh, contribution. So again, what are the most impactful legal initiatives around the globe with potential fragmenting effects, and what is their rationale? So um, when we talk about digital sovereignty, uh, what is the first thing that comes to our mind? Of course, it's a new policy construct that has been formulated and has been, this term has been used over and over again in the last two, three years. It has become a budge word. However, how do we understand it in simple terms? We can say that uh, digital sovereignty is about policies and regulations that aim at exercising state power and control on the internet public policy issues within their own territories, but owing to the nature of the internet, of course, such regulations and laws also have extraterritorial implications. So this is not a phenomenon that is related to a few countries or a particular region. We have seen that overall, like all the countries and regions are coming up with such kind of law. So in Europe, we see GDPR, we have digital secure uh, DSA, DMA. In China, we have PIPL. In India, we have Digital Personal Data Protection Act. And there are such legal initiatives around the world. So it's not limited to any one territory or a region. Now, if you look at it, this is a departure from the erstwhile liberal regime where largely private corporations were supposed to deal with issues like collection of data, processing, and the use of data. However, there was like increased dissatisfaction with how private corporations were doing quasi-public policy functions with lack of adequate constitutional check and balances. So we were seeing the rise of attention economy and the phenomena of surveillance capitalism. And today, when we talk in the context of generative AI and synthetic content, the need to have adequate regulation is felt even more. So on this part, in terms of regulation, we can say that, OK, there are legitimate reasons for states to have such regulations in terms of protecting and promoting their citizens' rights. However, such laws and regulations also need to be critically scrutinized so that they don't end up doing more harm than the positive benefits. For one, we need to assess whether these laws are following the standard tests of legality, necessity, and proportionality, and not giving excessive power in the hands of government agencies. Now, this is not the only motive why states are coming up with such regulations. Of course, there are other motives as well. There are strategic, uh, political, as well as commercial motives behind this. So let's go to the point of protectionism and fragmentation on that. So in terms of fragmentation, of course, there are technical aspects to it. And you know, we talk about having uh, open standards in terms of that. And few of my co-panelists will further touch on it. Uh, however, 
uh, I'm going to touch upon uh, the commercial uh, aspects of fragmentation as well as the political aspect of fragmentation. So what we actually see is that, OK, the issues like misinformation and disinformation has to be dealt with. However, if we see that different states are coming up with their different sort of laws, we actually need to have some sort of global convergence in terms of having international norms and best practices to deal with these issues. And the good part is that on some of these issues, there has been, we are seeing a tendency that, OK, there are certain uh, uh, things like having uh, grievance redressal mechanism which are coming up and we can share all these global practices so that you know there are some standard common norms which can guide uh, the states around the world when it comes to drafting over these issues now coming to the issue of protectionism of course there were certain countries which had the benefit of an early start and with most of the big corporation based in those places we can say that uh, a lot of other countries were excluded from the benefit of digital economy. And as we all say, the data is the new oil in the world. So if you look at where are the headquarters of big corporations, where are the data centers in the world? So of course, the states have a right to fight against the monopolistic tendencies of big corporations and put in place mechanisms which allow small businesses to flourish. However, such mechanisms should not be discriminatory to foreign businesses. There should be an equal and level playing field. We also need that in terms of cross-border data flow, states should not put unnecessary restrictions on free flow of data on basis of national security or critical information localization requirement. The data localization requirements should be kept at a minimal. In these regards, we can say that digital trade ag uh, agreements and negotiations like DEPA and G7's institutional arrangement for partnership can be a way in terms of harmon harmonizing the cross-border data flow. However, at the same point, we also need to take into account the position of Global South in these negotiations, because a lot of states in the Global South already are bereft of the digital economy, as well as they don't have enough institutional and infrastructural capacity. So there should be capacity building initiatives also, so that the countries around the world can take the benefit of big data, AI, and machine learning, and uh, are not excluded further. In that regard, I would say that, uh, to conclude my statement, that you know we need more liberalized sort of regime when it comes to uh, data flows and uh, free trade. So for example, Indian government recently came up with Digital Personal Data Protection Act. Now let's compare it with GDPR. While in GDPR there are certain positive obligations, like you need to have equivalent standards that are in place in Europe if the data has to, you know, if the cross-border data flow is, has to take place, or otherwise you need to have standard contractual clauses. So in that terms, OK, you have to pass a few tests, only then the data will be you know, allowed to travel. Instead, in Indian government, what they have done, that they have said that in general, we will allow the cross-border flow of data. There are no such uh, positive obligations. However, in exceptional cases, we can put certain countries in negative list if those some uh, there are certain problematic dimensions. So in general, it's a largely liberalized regime where certain countries will be put in the negative list based on uh, the guidelines which the government will provide. It's a recent text, so the guidelines are not there yet. So if we keep this sort of, uh, of restriction to cross-border data flow to the minimal, I believe we can protect the legitimate interest of our citizens as well as allow for a liberalized free trade uh, in terms of digital economy. So thank you, Nilish, uh, for this uh, insightful perspectives on, on how handling uh, worldwide resources on the internet and how to engage uh, with national uh, actors worldwide um, without posing specific limits uh, when it comes to capacity building especially. Uh, but still trying to keep um, local necessities and needs um, in mind. So speaking of which, especially when it comes to critical internet resources, um, we have our next uh, speaker. He's Venceslas Katimba. He's connected online. Um, and 
I don't know if he can hear us. Can we hear him? Uh, yes. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome. I think. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for giving the opportunity to speak. I'm a French speaker. Uh, I apologize. My English maybe cannot be very very well. So um, I just want to tell regarding uh, the point of uh, internet resources and uh, to to share the experience regarding what is happening in my country DRC uh, to promote the, digi the, the digital transformation and uh, the internet uh, uh, the inclusion of uh, the digital. So uh, in my country, you see DRC is. Uh, in the center of Africa and is a big country. We have uh, like nine country neighbors and um, we, we, we are not too, too, too much uh, far with the internet. So since 2021, it's the first time in my country there was a minister in charge of digitalization. And uh, this minister was created uh, since uh, uh, 2021, and uh, we started to build the foundation of uh, digital in DRC uh, with uh, some action that uh, the minister read, uh, did. We started to, to make the policy regarding the regulations. So in DRC before that, there was no uh, regulation regarding digital the digi digital sector. Um, and there was, uh, we, we worked for the first um, uh, law text, which is called Code Numeric uh, in DRC, and which is bring the regulation on the sector of digital in DRC. And this uh, law was, uh, has been adopted uh, last year, and it already published. So this is the basic now, um, we on on the regulation sector in my country, we can we have now a law which 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 uh, which regulate the digital sector. Uh, we work also to to make uh, to 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 make sure that the, the the my country is also in partnership with other country, and we we sign the Malabo Convention. Uh, regarding the cyber security and data protection. And uh, so regarding this sector, it is already done. In my country, we have many challenges uh, regarding uh, connectivity. Um, we have like uh, uh, more than 50% of uh, the coverage, which is not already done. We have many projects to build. Uh, fiber around the country, all infrastructure for the connectivity, to bring connectivity to all the people. Uh, it's a big country and many challenges regarding war and this, which is not, which affects uh, not the um, promotion of uh, the digital. And we already uh, work with other partners. Uh, we have the telecom company for working for coming from Vodacom. We have uh, this Airtel who are helping us to, to, to improve the digital sector here. Um, we have also regarding uh, internet connectivity and uh, resource of internet here in DRC. Mm -hmm. Regarding infrastructure, DRC is, all, is now connected only to one submarine cable works, but there is a big project with uh, Facebook, Google, and other private operator. They are now building the second cable um, to for Africa, which uh, we, will be land uh, very soon in DRC. So before the end of this year, we will have two submarine cable, and our plan is to have like five, uh, con to be connected to five submarine cable. We have also started many projects to do the interconnection with uh, uh, other countries, uh, African countries, neighbors. We have some connection with uh, with with uh, 
uh, I will never We are starting to lose him. Yeah, I think unfortunately we are losing him. Also, we to 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 interconnect the report. I think there are some connectivity issues there. Um, so I will make sure to uh, provide Vincenzo's um, reference uh, context to everybody who wants to keep uh, in, in touch with him uh, and maybe have a second chance to hear his contribution uh, firsthand. And also for uh, time reasons, um, we will proceed uh, with uh, with Bruna and her introduction. So I will now give the floor to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, you guys can hear me, right? No, just um, my intent for today was to go over a little bit of the policy network on internet fragmentation discussions. Um, it is a work that we have been doing together with the IGF community for almost two years now. We're at the second year of the PNIF framework. And um, I thought it would be important to bring that around here because the initial assessment was the idea that technical fragment, like internet fragmentation discussions were rather something very technical and s discussions that didn't really include a lot of the community. Maybe because of some of the debates being placed in a lot of the technical community or more academic ones. So the first assessment and maybe the thing that motivated us to, to bring up um, a policy network for that was um, helping share some of the resources or even like revisiting the discussions. And um, the PNIF um, has started developing a framework um, with three initial baskets. Um, and we talk about fragmentation um, in three different ways. The first one is fragmentation of the user experience. Second one is fragmentation of internet governance and coordination, which talks a lot to the debates we're having nowadays about the Digital Cooperation Forum, OASIS Plus 20, the IGF, where all of these spaces moving um, ahead, are they moving together and how? And the last one would be fragmentation of the internet technical layer, which is the most classical one. Um, and um, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna leave a lot of the technical debates to Andrea because I, I wanna share this a little bit with him, but then I can go over um, both on the governance and coordination and user experience as, as I was saying. Like, But starting with the governance and coordination one, w when we talk about this basket, we're basically discussing that um, all of those forests should be interacting with each other. Um, both standards and policy and internet governance spaces, they should coordinate, um, they should be inclusive. And if they stop to do it, um, the discussions might result in some level of fragmentation of the debate itself. We're not saying it fragments the internet, we're just saying it might be harder to follow up with these um, discussions. And um, the division of the debate would be something that would result in decisions being taken without consensus, lack of respect for the multi-stakeholder community, or even um, preference for multilateralism instead of the multi-stakeholder model of participation that we're used to. Um, fragmentation at the governance level, we, at the discussion paper the PNF just put out, put out, we also say that it might create knock-on effects for fragmentation at the other um, technical and, and user experience um, areas. So we basically have some asks for this debate and say that some, some of the practical, practical steps that can be taken would be to avoid introducing um, further bodies to internet governance landscape 
improve coordination, avoid siloed um, public policy discussions, and also um, be fully inclusive to all stakeholders and enable participation. And also that um, global internet governance must engage more closely with national governments because it is only the multi-stakeholder model that could be helping or a tool that can help like improve the multilateralism and some of the discussions around the UN 3.0. But when we go to the second basket, that's the user experience, and that's the one that relates more with some of the effects and things we see these days, um, we more or less define the user experience as the phenomenon by which different end users of the internet, when trying to perform the same action, can be presented with different content, options, interfaces. And that can happen in both as a consequence of client-side instruments, so device and applications, but also some sort of some level of um, intervention from states. So we're not saying that it's necessarily a bad thing. Um, it might happen, it might be part of the user experience or how the web has been shaped in order to cater to our um, necessities or even like um, the whole information landscape. But at the same time, we're also bringing up some bad sides and bad effects of that that could be internet shutdowns or when legislations just simply block apps from existing or people from having access to certain contents or geo-blocking, just to bring up an example around that. And um, just to, to wrap up on that one note, um, when we talk about um, fragmentation of the user experience, we insist in five principles. Um, the first one would be equality, second one would be enhancement, so we should be developing the same, allowing people to have the same level of experience when assessing the internet, um, and also allowing for users to make their own choices. Like, we know that a lot of our choices nowadays are kind of like um, shaped by companies themselves in the space they dominate in markets. And um, we also insist on impact assessment, so whenever a government is considering some measure that might result in a different um, experience for the user, such as a geo-blocking or a court order demanding to take certain content down, they should be able to perform some level of impact assessment and try to understand how that would affect um, citizens. And which could be basically like a three-part test um, just to see whether freedom of expression would be um, affected by that or any other things. Um, we also insist in harmonization, so every single a new um, framework, legal framework or public policy in this space should be talking to pre-existing policies, should be talking to company policies and so on. And last but not least, going back to the free choice um, part, um, we should allow users to shape their own experiences instead of the other way around. So I think I'll stop around here a little bit, but just to, to flag that a lot of this framework will also be discussed tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. at the Policy Network for Internet Fragmentation um, main session. So a lot of these debates will be continued. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Bruna, for uh, bringing, uh, again, the perspective on end users and to remember how fragmentation can also happen uh, through internet shutdowns, uh, geo-blocking, and again, I think uh, we are, uh, we delved a lot into um, the applicational layer, um, so I would like also to hear um, uh, Andrea, uh, that is connected online, um, to maybe uh, give us some more in, um, perspectives on the, the whole stack. Thank you, Daniele. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Very much. So um, I'm, I'm happy to be here, although virtually, and I'm, I'm, I hope you're all dealing well with the jet lag and you're enjoying the IGF. And I, you know, I wish I, were, I, was, where I was there with you. So thank you again for inviting me. And, uh, and this is a topic that indeed it's very relevant for ICANN, but it's relevant for everyone that really uses the internet. And um, you know, every time that I, have, I come to speak about internet fragmentation or to think about, I always see how by the day the issue becomes on one side more complex, but at the same time, even a little bit more dramatic in terms of what is laying ahead with us, for us. So we tend to take the internet for granted. You open up your phone, you open up your computer, 
you connect your smartwatch, whatever you have you, and you almost, you know, seamlessly, you see that the internet is there, you connect, you don't think about it. And you know, it has been like that for at least the past 25 years and a bit more. But, um, you know, we take it as a given and we don't think that what's going on underneath, beneath. And I personally think that if you look to the next 25 years or even the next five years, you know, we should seriously consider whether we can keep taking this principle for granted. And so let me go, you know, through the, as you, as you mentioned, we call it the stack or, you know, the global ecosystem of the internet. So basically when you speak about the internet, the internet is a <clears throat> network of networks that they all look like one internet because they all decide, you know, to use the same language, the same um Technically, we call it system of unique identifiers. And it's the way that those networks exchange data, strings of zeros and ones, okay? And that's, you know, the basic principle that keeps thousands of networks, around 60,000 of networks, looking like one single internet, because they all adopt this basically fundamental principle that anything is accessible from anywhere on the internet. If you stroll around Kyoto, uh, the, the venue of the meetings, you will see one of the fathers of the internet, which is Dean Cerf, is there. And you can ask him how disruptive this uh, principle was back then, and it still is today. So, but there we are speaking about the networks. We are speaking about how, you know, networks managed by different companies, by and large private companies, they all decide to use the same protocols to exchange information to each other. 90% of the time, maybe less, I don't want to go into the, uh, into the statistics, but when we think about fragmentation, legislation, I heard some of the distinguished speakers mentioning GDPR in Europe, mentioning initiatives in, the, in India, uh, the DSA and DNA package in, in Europe, we're actually speaking at those, the dot, that that we call the application layer of the internet, which we, we all know as the web, the World Wide Web, which is the most, the most known and most used one. So these are services, softwares, um, communication means that are built on top of the internet, of this network of networks. And that's where, you know, our daily life basically, you know, develops every day. Um, you know, sending messages via WhatsApp or iMessage, making video connection with Zoom or any other services. That's, those services, those applications are the one that in the past years are gathering more and more attention. I mean, who, those has been following the AGF maybe had the advantage of being looking at those issues with some advance from, you know, from respect to many others. But that's where the main policy discussion is happening. And that's where there is also this interesting distinction between the internet governance and the digital governance. And this layer, what that we call as the, the application layer, is the one where indeed issues relating to the sovereignty of countries needs to be dealt by public authorities in, time, in order to defend, promote the rights and the duties of its own citizens. But in doing so, there are increasing risks that you disrupt the layer that is underneath, which is the technical layer, which is the layer of the system of unique identifiers. And, and, you know, of course, as you know, such a complex technology as it is, and such as complex society as we're living it, is not always so clear cut. And so sometimes there is the real intention of disrupting these very same principles that I mentioned to you, that is, anything is accessible from anywhere in the internet. Sometimes that's the objectives, but sometimes that's not objectives, but they end up 
you know, risk to be that way. And that's where at ICANN, we want to, you know, raise the tension. That's where, you know, although we have very technical mandates to coordinate this glue, we want to flag where the risks are. You know, I just want to leave you with a reflection, a personal reflection. You know, um, if you think ICANN is this year is 25 years old, okay, it was created in 1998, we are celebrating in a couple of weeks the 25th anniversary. And if you look back at the world back then, 1998, return of 2000, um, some of you had the luck of not being born or, or very, very young, but you know, you may have studied that on the books. You know, there was a time where globalization was on the rise. I was just thinking in the WTO, because we're speaking about protectionism, uh, the door around in 2001 was when trade barriers across the globe were being taken down. And there was, you know, this push of integration of global markets, this push of, you know, the idea of the trade, it's indeed good for the economy, it's good for the, for the promotion of democracy. There, is, there was a whole political, geopolitical, economically, the uh, political economy um, framework that, that's up, upheld that one. And if you look at today, you know, you know just 24, 24 hours ago, we see another war breaking out in the Middle East. We see how, you know, the, the global context has changed, dramatically changed. Mm, and th this is another warning, and it's not to me to elaborate, but it is something that we have to consider that, you know, things don't happen into a vacuum. And even as taking a layer, we see that. So we have to be wary of, of those two dimensions. Thank, Thank you, you, Andrea, for underlying uh, all these complexities that are inherent uh, in the internet, but that also are strictly related to uh, how the world has changed. So I think that one um, common thread that is emerging here is around um, the idea of critical resources and how the state can have an impact uh, in this uh, with specific trade policies, but and, and therefore, uh, at the end of this whole chain, impacting end users. So there might be some food for thought there on specific uh, policy recommendations, uh, maybe keeping in mind uh, the end user. But also, uh, one thing I think it's um, emerging out of this specific conversation is that not all critical resources are managed by states. Um, for example, uh, one, one little piece uh, is also about IP, um, IPv4 blocks that are, um, are critical resource of the internet, but therefore as, uh, but are not also uh, managed solely by, by states. So uh, keeping the multi-stakeholder model in, in, in this and how um, protectionist policies are made by the state um, should actually relate to that is uh, a key point of uh, this discussion. So, um, uh, Herman is telling me that we have one online question, so two online questions. So I will ask him uh, to read those out loud, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Daniele. <coughs> so the two questions that we have online are the following. The first one from Samridi Kumar, he, he is asking, do we see a difference of priorities or approach towards the idea of fragmentation in the global north and the global south, particularly from a regulatory perspective? And then the second question by Amir Mokavari is, uh, what would be the effects of internet we weaponization against other nations, digital interference in other countries, and enactment to violence uh, in campaigns from abroad on internet fragmentation, especially when we cross border digital do not cooperate with national competent authorities? What could be done in this situation to avoid internet fragmentation? So back to the panel. So I will ask now uh, whoever of our speakers would like uh, to uh, reply to this, uh, maybe both of the questions, and then we will have time for just one question from the audience, if there are any. 
and then we uh, can try to uh, close the session. Uh, Bruna, okay, thank you. Yes. Thanks a lot. Um, just about the priorities, I, I don't know if it's possible to say whether there's a difference on priorities and where it comes from, but um, we are seeing, right, like a lot of countries and like s member states as well, like diving further on internet regulation aspects and discussions, right? Like DSA is one of them, um, AI Act on the EU is another one of them. In Brazil, we have been discussing for the last three to four years um, a proper like disinformation regulatory framework. And, and the point is that a lot of these regulations um, might influence, might result in some aspects or even changes to the internet as we see it today. And I think that will be the main challenge, right? When engaging with policymakers, when engaging with politicians, just remind them of the core, um, the critical aspects of the, the, the internet in general, or why is it important, or even to explain what a core order would be something that would be problematic or blocking an, an, an app or anything like that. So I wouldn't know to kind of like pinpoint whether there's a difference in priorities, but I, I just wanted to flag that we are seeing this kind of change in the, the mindset recently, whereas before a lot of states avoided regulation and now we're much more focused on regulating every single or maybe all of the internet aspects um, that we have been flagged or have been pointed out as like places for abuse or issues in terms of speech and, and rights in general. So just to say that, thanks. Thank you so much, Bruna. Um, I encourage anyone who wants to speak up and maybe ask a question to our uh, panelists. Um, okay, I don't think we have any specific questions. I might have one, um, and again, I will ask um, probably Andrea, I think is uh, the most uh, indicated person for this. Uh, so. Actually, I wanted to know a little bit more about this idea of um, managing the risk of fragmentation given its um, multifaceted nature. So this can be hard uh, to regulate. It's very hard to manage the multi-stakeholder model. And in, when it comes to specific risks of uh, fragmentation, uh, who do you think should be responsible for reviewing specific policy requirements that in this specific case might also uh, take into account priorities and the end user perspective. So Daniele, um, yes, so indeed, the model that, uh, as I said, underpins the internet, you know, the protocol layer, is a model that is, you know, now 30 plus years old. And it was built when the internet had nothing to do with what we define internet as of today. And the sheer number of people that designed this model, it's, of course, is not representative of what is the internet user base today. So there is a, there is a critical point, and you, you, know, you pointed out into the model that developed that, this multi-stakeholder model, this bottom-up model, that wasn't designed to scale up to that level and to include, you know, all the different interests and even geographically um, positions into that. And that's one of the challenges that IGAN has and many of the technical organizations have, you know, how to make sure that as the internet scales up in terms of users, in terms of application, in terms of complexity, the, mob, the, the models that governs it, underpins it, even in the, in the development of its protocols, of its technical applications, adapts to that. And that, for, any, for anyone that you know, participates in ICANN, knows that you know, this is a constant topic, you know, how to evolve the multi-stakeholder model. And uh, you know what I can say is that, and what we always say is that you know the the model is far from perfect. It's a bit like the famous phrase from Churchill, you know, that democracy is a terrible form of government, but it's the best of anything out there. 
So the multi-stakeholder model for the internet application layer, uh, sorry, the infrastructure layer is the one that works. It's not perfect, but it's open. It allows everyone to get in. When we look at the other layers, well, there it's a whole different series of approaches. You know, if you're lucky enough to be born in a region where your government is accountable, you may have channels to, you know, to go through a law that your government pushed you. But one, one thing that I want to ask, uh, respond was one of the questions there. Um, there, were, there, there were two very interesting, but I only limit to one, is the different priorities of fragmentation from the global south to the global north. What I think is that, yes, there may be different priorities. And sometimes, you know, protectionism or harming a different country, it's one of the priorities. But what I'm actually worried about is the effects. Because fragmenting a market that is 500 million strong as the European Union has a different impact on the economy and the society of a market of a country that is in global south as is 30 million users. Okay. So the impact that that one has is way larger that you can see in Europe. So some regions of the world, in a way, can withstand fragmentation, can survive through that, because they have a developed enough market that, in a way, can survive through that. They can develop their applications, you know, will be an awful situation, but can survive that. Others, you know, it's yet a step more of pushing this digital divider. It used to be one of the you know, main issues of the WSIS and the early IGF, yet to a next level. So that's one of the things that I hope that we all take in consideration. I'm sure that in the IGF community, this one is well ingrained. So not everybody can withstand the interfragmentation and, and the protectionism that we are seeing around. The, the effects are very much different. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, my bad, actually, uh, we have uh, another contribution also on this specific point of engaging the Global South and how we can tackle policy um, needs, uh, also from Nilish. Uh, so I'll leave you the floor. Uh, personally, uh, I think that, okay, there is not an issue per se with regulating. In fact, I argue that we need regulations to find solutions to problems like dissemination of disinformation and misinformation. And these are critical issues that are, need to be dealt with because these are not only issues about harm in the digital domain. In Global South especially, uh, due to the spread of disinformation, we have seen that people are losing their lives. There are riots because somebody posted something about a particular community and it got spread. So, of course, the state need to, you know, deal with these low and order situations. The problem only arises when, you know, when these regulations go beyond the legitimate ends and, you know, is used to curb the exercise of fundamental rights, is used to curb the dissent, the freedom of speech, the freedom of expression. So, in that regard, I would rather say that, you know, the convergence of policy at a global level on these issues, at dialogue at the international level is the way to go. If we have international norms regarding how to combat misinformation, what should be the role of the state, what should be the role of the technical community, what is the role of uh, big corporates, then you know, if a state who has a lot of market power is asking Twitter uh, or any of the corporate for that matter, uh, that, okay, you take down these accounts, uh, otherwise we will deny you access. Those can also uh, refer to those international guidelines and can say that, no, like we will f try to follow uh, what is their in international norms. The civil society of that state then can say that, no, you are going beyond the internationally agreed upon norms. Uh, the government is going beyond and curtailing the rights. But so there should not be an issue with the regulations, but what kind of regulations we are going for. So I don't believe that uh, regulations are problematic per se. It 
for me, I think that it was a wrong idea that you know we can leave uh, this sort of public policy functions to private corporations. And of course, what it resulted in, we just saw that okay, there was a rise of surveillance capitalism, and also the, so like from time being, we have seen Cambridge Analytica, we have seen Snowden revelations, we have seen electoral interferences where private corporations are hands in hands with uh, uh, state as well. So that is like my understanding of this issue. Also, I would like to, um Keep once again the attention to, uh, there was another question uh, re regarding the weaponization of the internet. And if this could actually be, I suppose, um, moved also through uh, protectionist uh, policy. Uh, what's, your, what's your thinking in this regard? You know, the question about weaponization of internet is also you know, if we look at global north and global south, there's a different perspective on that. Because the global, in the global north, uh, we see the talk about cybersecurity that, okay, uh, if you are trying to harm the critical infrastructure in a particular country, you are launching a cyber attack, which can lead to the failure of critical infrastructure. But in global south, we see countries like Russia and China, which are more concerned about information security, they see that, okay, the information can also lead to harm to their society and uh, the stability of their country. So how we look at the weaponization in that term, we also need to assess that, okay, what are the concerns of the global south? Because I don't believe that there can be one global norm or one global solutions for these things. We live in a world where we come from different societies and different contexts, and without underlining those contexts, uh, we cannot come up with you know one single policy formulation. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. I also wonder if this uh, is maybe you're also suggesting that. Uh, cybersecurity frameworks might also include uh, local uh, identities and local needs again. Uh, but I will uh, give the floor to Bruna that uh, I think wanted to contribute something um, in yes, this do. regard. Yeah, no, just about the um, international standards or norms for regulating disinformation and so on. This is a rather confusing, complex, and multi layered discussion, right? Like, we are still trying to make social media companies apply their own like policies and, and the things they decide on every day at the same level to every single state, and it doesn't happen. I'm working on a campaign um, currently that's talking about basically like safeguarding elections and users and like how do you actually ensure that every single voter um, gets to have the same level of protection all over the world. But at the same time, we still have like policies and decisions from companies and many other spaces that prioritize some spaces and countries instead of others, right? So I'm a little wary when we come and, and do a lot of like conversations about this, what will be a global and international standard or conversation for that, um, because um, often when we come to those spaces, it's not it's much less my part of the world that speaks, it's much less the global majority, it's the richer countries, right? It is um, Europe, it might be the US, and these are the main players in this discussion. So the, the same level of like global standards or the policy discussions for every single country won't happen if we continue to insist in the same kind of like power imbalances in spaces. So we definitely need or might need something special here, something that brings in the perspectives of victims, of the communities that are mostly affected by these issues and, and by the things that we're talking about. And that also means bringing in people from Ethiopia to talk about fragmentation or people from Congo to talk about the issues about connection, just like Vincent I was talking before. So we do need to do a lot more work on including perspectives in this conversation so we can move forward. Uh, thank you, Bruna. I will take this, may I take this as a, a closing statement? I think you mentioned again uh, capacity building, so um, especially in the global south, 
and trying to include them in this uh, global discourse. I will uh, give you one minute, Nilesh, to maybe uh, doing your closing remarks, uh, just one minute. Then we'll have Andrea and um, we can conclude. So uh, I would just like to conclude by saying that uh, we have to accept certain realities of the world and these are the realities that there are new governance challenges. We cannot just say that what worked 20 years before is going to work effectively even now. So since we have seen new challenges in the past five, six years, over a decade, we have seen what kind of harms misinformation can do, what kind of harms the electoral interferences can do. So of course we need regulations, but at the same time we have to see that uh, while there are certain global sets of norms which lead to convergence of these policies, also there should be space for uh, various different contexts in which the states come from. So if we allow such kind of policy development that would be uh, uh, protect the fragmentation of the internet as well as uh, you know allow the countries to pursue their own set of policies. At the same point of time, uh, in terms of trade, I believe that the localization requirements should be minimal, uh, the cross-border flow of data should be promoted, so and probably digital trade agreements may be a way forward, but they need to keep in mind the realities of the Global South, that they are already excluded from uh, the benefits of the digital economy, and they might like institutional capacity, so this should be taken into consideration and uh, in mind while going forward with these negotiations. Thank you. Thank you, Nilesh. Uh, Andrea, I'll give you the floor for one minute of closing uh, statement. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you, everyone. <clears throat> I, you know, I really like what Samir just said, and also what Bruna said. All of all of you, that, you know, the impact of fragmentation, it's to me is is very is way larger in to the global south, and the and the effects the effects they can have that um, you can see in Europe or even China or India itself. Um, you know. I'm sure that in Brussels, when DSA or GDPR or the DMA or AI Act were designed, you know, not much reflection was put into, you know, what are the impacts on the global south. That's not really the priority was pushing them. It's we need to defend our markets. We need to defend our users. And you know that's understandable, but still a certain point of where these actions actually risk to compromise something that if you look back, it's something marvelous. You know, we never had such a technology, we never had such a you know, such a way to connect everyone everywhere across platforms, across languages, across time zones. And as I said at the beginning, we took it for granted. You know, the internet is there, you connect, you know, you only pay for, for your, you know, internet service providers. There is a public way, if you don't pay, you just pay for the device. And, you know, I don't think we can take this principle for granted any longer. And, uh, and we need to fight for that. But we need to fight singling out which are the right battles and which are the right layers. And often we see that Policies, policymakers, elected officials, they mess it up with the layers. They think they are tackling some issue, like free speech, you know, cybercrime, and there is all there was this question about the weaponization of the internet. This is something you know that we at ICAN we see the EDNS has been used as a way of attacking other countries, something that the technology wasn't designed for. But you need to be specific, you need to know what you are acting for right. and be mindful of the consequences. So Hopefully we will we'll have more chances at the IGF to do that because the spaces to, dis to discuss these issues are shrinking, unfortunately. Yes, exactly. Uh, again, uh, I would like to thank every uh, speaker and every panelist for today. I would also like to thank everybody who connected in their own time zones. I would like to connect Pedro, one of our organizers that uh, con is connected from Spain, uh, sorry, from Brazil. Uh, right now, uh, Pilar also that just uh, arrived from Spain after a super long uh, trip. 
Um, and I just wanted to point out that, again, it's very important to try to include everybody and also in the design of these policies uh, that seem to have local impacts. In, the fa in, in fact, we might also have some unexpected global um, issues. So it's always it's important to include those other perspectives in um, spaces such as the IGF where we can actively uh, contribute and talk about the specific issues as a community, as a global community. Um, and also, I would uh, also have been very happy to hear more uh, from Venceslas. But again, um, this is also connectivity issues are, um, I think, at the center of this whole um, conversation. Um, so there is a need also to include those perspectives and not lose um, not lose focus. So um, we are out of time, unfortunately. Um, we uh, will share our report and our policy uh, recommendations, as well as the contacts uh, from our panelists for everybody interested in following week up uh, after this session. So I would like to thank again everybody uh, for this session. A uh, little round of applause and um, have a good night, good morning or <laughs> continuing your day. Bye.